All right, welcome to the At Bat Baseball Podcast presented by War Media, where we give you our thoughts on the latest Chicago baseball news as well as take a trip around the league. I am Saul Rodriguez along with my co-host Miles Porter. How was your week, man? Fun week. Fun week in uh, Miami. Saw the Marlins play. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So it was funny because on Friday, uh, me and Miles ended up at baseball games in two different cities. Uh, me, me in Chicago, Miles in Miami. Tell me about that, man. You actually had a great matchup. I, I, I was telling you uh, before we started, saw that matchup of Corbin Burns versus Pablo Lopez. Uh, that, that, I mean, tell me about that. Yeah, that was, that was a, a great matchup. Um, a lot of, a lot of swings and misses on both sides. Um, they were both pretty dominant and it just came down to, to just walks. That's really what that game came down to. Um, so, I mean, with that being said, offensively, obviously there wasn't a lot that was going on, but it was, it was pretty cool. Now the Marlins didn't have a lot of fans in the stadium. So you know, Lorenzo Cain isn't very happy with a couple of the strike three calls that have been called on him and his teammates. Uh, so I hear him in center field screaming at the home plate umpire saying, let's go, come on, clean it up. Um, uh, Avisayo Garcia, I'm hearing him talk to the fans behind him, just having full blown conversations and hearing those little, uh, those little moments right there was, it was cool. You, you really don't hear that at like a Cubs or Sox game or a Yankees or Red Sox game because these are places that are getting filled up um, no matter how bad the team is doing. So, you know, that was pretty cool. That was a cool aspect of it. And, you know, interesting stadium. I like it. It was cool. I think they could do a few things differently to maybe create more of an authentic experience. But besides that, I thought it was great. No, yeah, I've, I've always wanted to go to that stadium too. I know uh, I did also say I was like, I was, or uh, I told you before that uh, what a name for that stadium. I mean, Lone Depot. What is it? What is it? Lone Depot Park? Yeah, Lone Depot Park, something like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just like, man, like, I wish I would have kept the Marlins Park. Not that that would add any more fans or take any fans away. Uh, just, uh, it just, you know, wish I had more fans. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Money talks just like the just like how um, uh, Miller Park uh, went from that <sighs> legendary name to American Family Insurance Field. Like, um, like I, as a as a Cubs fan, now you know I don't really care about the Brewers, but come on, how, how more perfect can that name get? Right, Miller Park for a yeah. like the Brewers team. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it perfect. cannot. Yeah. It doesn't get better than that. I got to um, say a paragraph to say what state I'm going to. <laughs> we're on a breath halfway through <laughs> for real for real uh no yeah so i went to uh the yankees uh white Sox game at guarantee rate field on friday and i mean it was it was set up uh pretty ideal i ha i have a really good buddy uh lupe who's a giant yankees fan and so i went there uh to kind of support aaron judge uh, i don't want to say i was supporting the yankees but uh uh, just more of, you know, I wanted to see an Aaron Judge bomb, and I got that and more because uh, Stanton, uh, Donaldson, and Gallo all hit home runs. Um, it was to, we'll get to, we'll get to the series and talk about that. It was pretty tough for the White Sox and overall, but uh, from a from a neutral perspective in that, that, that game was awesome. He's uh, Garrett Cole. He did, he just like every, I feel like every start this year, he hasn't necessarily had his best stuff, but he struck out nine, gave up three, and got yeah. the win. Yeah. So, um, Definitely uh, pretty uh, cool to see um, all those guys heat up. I mean, the Yankees are just like a powerhouse, like unstoppable powerhouse. I think I just yeah. I just heard they, they haven't lost like two games since like April 10th, uh, which is ridiculous. So, so um, crazy. yeah. So uh, so at bat baseball podcast takes over uh, MLB for a day. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, no, that, that was definitely fun weekend and uh, glad to have you back from Miami in one piece. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I made it, guys. I'm all good. <laughs> all right, well, we'll we'll uh, trans transition over to Chicago baseball officially, um, and we'll keep going with those White Sox. We were talking about that the, a little bit with the Yankees game, but so yeah, they they took on the Cleveland Guardians earlier in the week, and they ended up tying that series one one. That they actually bounced back from that Josh Naylor game, um, and were able to, uh, Oof, my yeah. Uh, they were able to win a game in that series. Uh, uh, game three was postponed, though, due to a number of COVID cases in Cleveland. So hopefully that's not something of a sign to come. Uh, but, yeah, the Yankees uh, came in to guarantee right field and just smashed the Sox three games out of four. Um, in in game one, the Yankees outscored – or, sorry, in game one and two, the Yankees outscored the Sox 25-11. to 11. 
Uh, but it, overall in the series, uh, the Yankees outscored them 32 to five. Um, and when it comes to the homers, I mean, Yankees are just, you know, hitting homers at a ridiculous pace. Those guys are yeah. just launching balls out of the stadium. They out homer the Sox eight to four. Um, and then you know, also in the, in, in the game that the, the, the lone win for the Sox, um, Hendricks, uh, blew a save. That's his third of the season. Yeah. Um, but the, again, the White Sox were able to win on a Luis Robert, uh, hit, um, in the 10th. Um, but you watching that series, man, you saw anything in particular, or was it just like, you know, two teams that are just on two different levels at the moment. Two teams that are just on two completely different levels. The Yankees are playing with all the momentum in the world. Uh, they they are they are a truck, and you cannot get in their way. They are they are clicking on all cylinders that you possibly can click on. Um, you know, I, I talked about it last week. The certain certain mistakes with the White Sox kind of came back to haunt them, and I think with with this it was. More the pitching side, um, you know, offensive, offensively, it's, it's not awful. Um, but at the same time, if you're talking about from a pitching standpoint, they're, they, they just had no answer. They had no answer at all. The, the Yankees came here and just ha- everyone was just boosting their stats. That's, that's really what was going on with, the, with that series. Um, you know, what, what, now I'm at the point where I'm starting to think if the White Sox want to be – any in, in sort of any you know contention this year going going forward and you know excelling the, the way that we know that they can they got to start looking ahead to you know a couple of other closes or a couple of other arms in general that can come help save this bullpen a bit um because the, the Yankees aren't going anywhere uh, a few other teams in the AL aren't going anywhere and the Sox are in my opinion are just as talented as all these teams um, but I think they have a little bit of the yips right now. There's a little bit of a, um, just trying to trying to f- figure themselves out a little bit, trying to get that momentum back from from last year. But you know, teams get better in the off season. Teams understand where the, who the White Sox are. So when they come to town or when the Sox go to whoever stadium that they play, they're gonna bring it. Well, whichever team they play is gonna bring it. Um, you know, when it starts from me, from my in my opinion with the White Sox. It does start with the pitching. It does right now. Offensively, they're gonna they're gonna start to put it together more and more. Um, very solid team offensively, but you know, looking looking at certain parts of, of this bullpen and a little bit of the of the rotation. Um, you know, you know, I'm glad Keiko had a great start. Uh, you know, and what he did with five shutout innings, only allowing four hits. Um, if we can get more consistency out of that from him, um, if the Sox can figure out some sort of way of um, a few of the other starters or other bullpens arm are struggling, you know, I think looking to bringing some only a guy or two in to kind of help make the difference. And I think that's where they've always kind of struggled a bit. No, yeah, definitely. The, the Keiko thing was, was really surprising. I mean, he's been yeah. pitching better than he, than he has the first in the first month of uh, yeah. in the month of April. But uh, yeah, that was, that was an, a nice surprise. Also, uh, Yohan Moncada coming back and he's, I mean, He's looking more like, you know, his 2019 self since he came yeah. back. Hopefully can maintain maintain it. Uh, he has an OPS of over 900 in his first six, seven games. So um, it's nice to see uh, because what he can do, I feel like, is carry the offense for a little bit. I know Luis Roberts looking more like himself, too. Mm-hmm. Um, I know uh, in the in game one against the Royals last night, um, uh, the White Sox were able to win on a two-run homer in the 10th inning against the Royals yep. um, by Roberts. So, yeah, those those are the types of guys that can carry the offense, and that's something they need right now. Because I mean, they it, it's just uh, overall not not clicking. Um, and, and then also, yeah, from the as you said, from the bullpen perspective, yeah, it's it's been really tough. I mean, with with Liam Hendricks struggling, and then also uh, I was gonna say out like one of the only guys that has been uh, doing well or uh, at least living up to uh, his expectations is Kendall Graveman. Uh, but he did have a, a rough a rough night yesterday against the Royals. Um, giving up a few runs, uh, but yeah, no, it's it's gonna be interesting to see what the White Sox do at the at the deadline because they can do a lot. They could you know get a a, a, a bat off the bench or, or just get a bat for the lineup or uh, get somebody for the rotation as the injuries or you know they could they could fill a lot of needs. Um, not sure they're gonna get every single one, um, but it'll it'll definitely be uh, something to look at. Um, looking forward, they do have uh, a few more games against the Royals. Um, it's actually uh, in because of rainouts and, and postponements. They actually have a it's a five game series. Um, when when this comes out, it'll be there. It'll only be a couple games left. But they got the Royals for a few more, and then the Yankees at Yankee Stadium, um, culminating with the game on Sunday. 
uh, on Sunday Night Baseball. Um, yeah, w- w- looking ahead, it, that that game or the series against the Yankees was a giant test, probably the biggest test the, the Sox had. They weren't able yeah. to pass. Um, but w- yeah. what do you think uh, they can take away from the series? They can, uh, you know, take to New York this weekend and uh, try to, you know, take out the Yankees this time around. Yeah, you know, I think I think really just damage control. Um, you know, pitchers can't be leaving the balls over the plate. Um, can't be walking guys. Um, just damage control. Let the offense let the offense keep doing what the offense has been doing. Because, you know, I said it before. I don't think the the Sox did terrible during that series, um, offensively, especially against the team like the Yankees. Um, so you know, if that, if this offense continues to just improve the way it does. Um, you know, I'm loving what I'm seeing out of Tim Anderson and, and Luis Robert. Um, if, if, if they can keep on building off of what they're doing offensively um, and, you know, in terms of these arms being able to kind of control the damage a bit, it's going to make the biggest difference in the world. Um, and, and, and really, I don't even think just for the Yankees, maybe just in general this season, because it, it seems that there's been a lot of uh, kind of like kind of like a teeter totter if, if, if the Sox are hitting well sometimes the pitching isn't isn't keeping up if they're they're pitching well then the bats go quiet if they're able to just you know kind of find that happy medium as much as they can you're never going to be perfect throughout the season one is always going to be better than the other to some sort of capacity if if they can do that that is going to make the biggest difference for them against the yankees which is huge um and then every other team going forward is and, and and you know that's also what i'm hoping for them because of the talent on this team is just, it's endless. Um, so, you know, damage control, keep guys off the base. Don't give any free passes, uh, make everybody earn it, play defense, got to limit some of the, some of the foolish errors that happen, um, you know, and the stocks will be good. They, they, they have it made for them. It's still early in the season. Um, and there's, there's many things that they can, that they can, you know, improve on going forward. So I think, you know, with those little things, they'll be just fine. No, yeah, and, and it was also good to see uh, Johnny Cueto in his first game as a White Sox. Yeah, uh, yeah. Domin- dominate the Royals. I mean, they they really yeah. he really did work against his former team, the team he won the World Series with, Mike Martinez. Yeah. And uh, we'll definitely get into more White Sox talk later. Um, I, I was able is able to interview our first guest ever, absolute history. Um, <laughs> having uh Herb Lawrence from uh from CHGO podcast, the White Sox podcast for them. Uh, that's available on YouTube and all podcast platforms. So we'll definitely get into more White Sox talk later. Uh, but now shifting our focus over to the Cubs, who um actually playing some of their best ball they have all season, which is, yeah. you know, crazy uh, to see. Um, they've bounced back. A lot of players are hitting right now. Uh, they're currently uh, 14 and 20. Uh, they had their first series win uh, since the first week, since that first series against the Brewers when they uh, defeated the Padres 2-1 to one last week in a series. Um, they also defeated the Diamondbacks, so they had back-to-back series wins, uh, two games to one, and then what again last night on Monday uh, to take out the Pirates in a crazy game. But yeah, no, that uh, that first series against the Padres, that was, I mean, that's one of that was one of the hottest teams in baseball going into that series. Yeah. Um, you know, so it was interesting to see that that the Cubs were able to, you know, get a win there. Um, and when it came to the Diamondback series, also I, I was thinking. Um, looking earlier in the season, I was like, "Oh, it's a favor- favorable, favorable part of this of the uh, schedule." But the Diamondbacks have also been playing well, man. I mean, they they got uh-huh. they actually have some of the best pitching in the National League, and the Cubs were able to win a game in which Zach Gallen pitched in. So, yeah. um, you know, they, that, that was good to see. Um, also, Justin Steele had a great ten uh, K performance on Sunday. Uh, yeah. He was actually the first Cubs draftee to do that since Jeff Samarja in twenty fourteen, and the first lefty since. Uh, since Rich Hill in 2007. So that's crazy. Um, but in those those two series, for example, uh, what, what, what are a couple of things that you saw that you really liked from the Cubs? Confidence. Confidence at the play. Confidence on the mound. Every player, um, you know, with, and, and really I did not have the Cubs winning that series against the Padres just because there is a little bit of a gap there in terms of where these teams are at. So to see, to see that series win, it just, it warms my heart. Um, they were very confident against the Padres. Um, you know, this is a team that that came into San Diego that just wasn't afraid. Um, offensively, you know, they they had a lot of momentum. Uh, the arms did great, um, and and so I, it's just it just shows that you know even even with this team that doesn't have high expectations, it, it's going to be fun to watch them spoil something 
for one of the one of the more competing teams this year. Um, so that is that's you know one of the big things I took away from it. I you know I I, I love seeing the Padres get beat by the Cubs. I do. Um, so this is just so many great things to take away from that series, and just uh, you know it shows the, the potential of where they where they're gonna where they can take things down the line from now. So you know, good for them, and uh, you know let's see what, let's see what happens when we see them again. No, yeah, it, it was it's it's really cool to see you know when when teams that with with low expectations you know are able to uh, you know take teams out maybe in September or August or something. It'll that'll def- that'll definitely be uh, fun to watch. Um, also, uh, one guy to talk about too is specifically is Wilson Contreras. I mean, uh, he's been hitting all season, uh, you know, but particularly now, um, he went off in in Monday's game uh, against the Pirates uh, with that first inning grand slam. Uh, and I actually saw the is really random stat, but a uh, very specific stat uh, by Christopher Kamka, uh, great follow on Twitter. Wilson Contreras is the first ever DH to hit a grand slam from the number one spot in the order in the first inning. So that's, again, just goes into the, the whole, you know, um, you, if you watch a baseball game every day, you'll, you might see something different every day. Yeah, so. yeah. And it's, that's pretty awesome. And, and, and then it just goes into, I mean, Contreras was also saying when he asked about, you know, what he thinks about, you know, the trade deadline or, you know, extension talk. And, yeah. and he, he did say he's open to talking extension uh, during the season, uh, but he's bracing for a trade. Um, yeah. I, I think, I think we're leaning towards more of a trade. I think if they were going to resign, Wilson yeah. Contreras, it probably would have happened already. Um, but what for the Cubs? I mean, this is best case scenario, a red hot Contreras going into the, you know, into the trade deadline, you know, get yeah. as much, get as much as you can for him. But yeah, yeah it, it'll, it'll be sad to see him go um, because yeah. this is probably some of the best baseball we've seen him, you know, play as a Cub. Um, but yeah, what, what are your thoughts on that? And, and, and what do you think was most likely to happen with him? Oh gosh, I get so much. I love Wilson Contreras. <laughs> This is this is my favorite player on the Cubs. Um, so yeah, you know, I think I think realistically, just in terms of where the Cubs are going, in terms of reshaping of who they are, I don't, I don't know necessarily if it's so much of a, a rebuild and, and more of like a reshape because we do have a lot of pieces that we are going to be using going forward. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see Wilson go somewhere else at the trade deadline. Um, you know, it, 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 it'll be it'll be hard for, for us Cubs fans, another another tough trade deadline uh, for us to deal with. But, you know, um, it, it it does make sense. I think it does make sense um, if they do sign him, if they do give like, you know, give him some sort of incredible extension. Beautiful. He is 100 percent the kind of player that you can build something around. I just I look at players in the system like Miguel Amaya. Um, and I had to ask myself if if they if they were to extend Wilson's contract, what about him? What about what about some players like that who are who the Cubs are kind of setting their hopes on to for him to improve this year in the minors, um, and maybe in a few years then he gets called up. Uh, it, you know, it, it wouldn't make sense with that scenario. But if you want a leader, like kind of like a Buster Posey kind of kind of person for the Cubs or a Joey Votto kind of person for the Cubs. Giving him that extension makes all the sense in the world. He would be just as useful in terms of leadership and production as he was, um, you know, even if he went somewhere else. So I think both scenarios make sense. Um, but the Cubs are still trying to look to get more prospects, um, trying to build a little bit more towards the future in terms of just bringing in new younger faces. That makes sense as well. So I think it can go either way. Um, I think just with the history of what the, what they have done, we saw what happened last year. They are more than willing to, you know, let we'll, let Wilson Contreras go to another team to compete there uh, and bring in younger or new faces um, in result of that. So it can go either way, but I think I think more than more likely than not, he will be dealt with at the deadline. Yeah, and it's one of those things that I think the Cubs would benefit either way, right? It's like you, yeah. you're, you're going to sign them. If you sign them, you have a, you know a great catcher to bet on for you know for the future. If you trade them, probably going to get some decent uh, you know trade pieces, especially with the way he's playing now. So that'll be you know fascinating to watch over the course of the next couple of months to see how yeah. he does and to see what the Cubs do in general. 
Uh, yeah, so in this, in this recent hot stretch, too, um, wanted to give it up for some other guys, too. Like, you know, say Suzuki's looking more like his April self. Yeah. Um, Ian Happ, uh, Frank the Tank, he might, you know, he might have seen our last episode and seen, you know, that, you know, we were, you know, maybe talking about the end of Frank the Tank. Well, guess not. Well, guess what? He's he's uh, obviously saying that we're wrong there, uh, that he, yeah. you know, that he's, he's got some more left in the tank. Uh, he's oh, been yeah. hitting a lot better. But how about that uh, that grand slam that 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 you know that almost was but wasn't? Oh, <laughs> oh my! He hit one. He hit one to, to the track and he smashed. I think it was like 106 off the bat. Yeah. And, it, and somehow did not. I mean, that's just another reason why, or it's another um, uh, piece of proof that um, that they have dead balls out there, man. It's it's it's, it's you know it's disappointing, but it is yeah. what it is. Um, yeah. Finally, got to see uh, Andrew Anderton. Andrelton Simmons uh, appeared in the game as a Cub on Sunday, um, and he looked pretty good out there. You know, following that uh, that injury, um, Nico Horner unfortunately goes to the injured list. Um, mm-hmm. Just another, just adding to the list of, of injured Cubs. Uh, yeah. But yeah, no, it, it'll be it, it'll be uh, fun to watch to see how far this stretch can go if they can continue it. Again, the schedule seems like it favors them. You know, if they can. Um, you know, take a couple more from the Pirates, and then uh, they host the Diamondbacks this weekend. Uh, so it'll be, you know, uh, something to watch out for if they can continue, you know, winning series. So, um, yeah. and they they actually have the, 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 you know, and I've said this before, they have the second most favorable um, schedule in the National League uh, after the the Brewers. So, um, if the Cubs can take advantage of that, you know, anything can happen. Uh, we'll look now around the league. Uh, some of the things that I noticed yep. over the week, uh, Philly's offense, uh, you know, you know, isn't translating to wins. They continue to hit, but it's just, you know, it's not, you know, the wins aren't happening. Um, their defense is really, really bad. But really, you know, besides their their defense, their pitching has, has been one of the main issues, too, uh, that nobody would feel like nobody's been talking about. They, people didn't really look at it. They just looked at the defense to start the season. But, yeah, their pitching is pretty bad. Um, what, what have you seen from those guys? Yeah, you know, I can't. I, I'm not too surprised with some of these issues coming up. Um, Kyle Schwarber is not an elite defender, but he's still a solid defender. Uh, Nick Cassianos has never been a great defender. He's he's he's, he's never been that player. Um, so there there are there are some there are some things defensively that they could do much better at. Um, Alec Bowman third, he, you know, he's still, he's still very young. Um, but I do think that he struggles a lot defensively and it is, it is a mixture of that and the, the pitching that has not been incredible for them. This is a very, this is an extremely offense heavy team. So as, as I'm watching this team unfold throughout the year, kind of like I said about a few other teams, um, Defensively, I think they have to improve because, you know, if, if 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 for some reason we can't we can't field the ball, if we're kicking the ball around, at least give us a pitcher on the mound who's going to give us six to seven solid innings to give us a chance. This is a team that will score runs, but that is what their specialty is: scoring runs. So if there is something that they can improve, there's something that you know they can do with their rotation and uh, maybe with their bullpen or or you know, just, just having the, just, just working on their defense a little bit more, that'll, that'll be, that'll be great. I mean, I'm seeing videos of Bryce Harper take ground balls in the infield. Why? For what? <laughs> it's funny. It's cool to talk about. It's like, I get it. Um, but if this is a team that's trying to compete, if this is a team that really wants it, if I, if I'm, if I'm, you know, one of the coaches on the team or the managers, I'm getting the, I'm getting my guys together before the game, getting the infielders in there. We're taking ground balls. We're taking fly balls. Um, and we're working on that. I don't want to see my outfielder at second base. I just don't. Now it's 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 cool. I get it. Um, but the Phillies are so much better of a team that they're able to, you know, really show. And it's just these things right here that I feel like they can they can drastically improve on. I think really just by putting in the work outside of outside of the games and you know, you know. Uh, in, in certain aspects, you got to understand who, who you who you can and cannot put out there. I know sometimes it's tricky with Schwarber, who's a lefty with a lefty on lefty matchup, and Cassiano's being a righty um, gives them kind of more leeway in certain situations. 
got to figure out how to find that happy medium with those two because um, Cassianos is not a very solid outfielder, which is okay. Um, in my opinion, Schwarber's a better outfielder, but you know we gotta we gotta figure out you know some sort of solution when it comes to that um, because that balance right now is 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 very off. This is a very offensive team. It's not gonna work. It's not gonna work going forward. You gotta play both sides. No, yeah. It, 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 well, the thing is too with uh, with Harper too that I've heard about that he's playing uh, through a torn UCL. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So that's that was it just. Yeah. insane to me because of like mm-hmm. how good he's playing regardless but yeah I, right. I don't understand the whole him playing infield I don't know what that would do I mean I, I don't think that would help the situation whatsoever um so yeah hopefully the Phils can find it uh because they can play some really good games I mean that series against the Dodgers is really interesting but for them in the wrong for the wrong reasons of giving up a lot of leads um you know the uh the I was going to come in here talking about the red showing a little bit of life but after that after getting uh after uh they no hit the pirates but they still <laughs> lost so that that's probably one of the strangest things i've ever seen um a hunter green pitched you know a hell of a game you know nine striking out nine seven plus shutout innings yeah. um but yeah no it's just the reds being the reds uh I, another thing i wanted to talk about too was uh the padres and manny machado um, and we, we talked a little bit about them before the losing a series to the Cubs, but talking about the positives, I mean, what they've been able to do without Fernando Tatis has been crazy. Yeah. Um, Manny Machado has been killing it. You know, one mm-hmm. of the front runners for national league MVP, yeah. uh, what, like what are the, what are the positives from them? Like, and what have you seen for Manny Machado? That's different from other years, maybe. Yeah. He, um, I think, I think with Machado, I think he's aging very well. Um, I know there were, you know, there are certain aspects of who he was early in his career that a lot of fans weren't very favorable of. Um, but he, you know, he is, he is growing up. He has grown a lot. Um, his ability as a third baseman and an infielder is just something we're, we're not going to see a lot of. We're, we're barely going to see that ever. Um, and offensively for him to be as consistent um, and as confident as he's been, I love it. I love every single second of it. He should be hitting for a high average. He should he should be driving in a lot of runs. That is how talented he is. That is who he is every single year. That is who he should be every single year. Um, and so you know, this is this is something that I, this is this doesn't surprise me because this is who I expect him to be every single year. I don't expect anything else from him. Um, he is so gifted. It doesn't it doesn't make sense. It's unfair. Um, so. That, that's a lot of what I'm seeing from him, um, you know, and, and, you know, his teammates as well. I, I love Cronenworth. Uh, just so many, so many great things to point out with this squad. Um, you know, I love Alfaro as well. I, <laughs> I love the home run that he had. Um, so this, this is just a team that is, that is put together very well this year. And they're, they're in a very tough division. This is a very, I don't know, my opinion, I think it's the toughest division in baseball. Everyone's good. Um, so any other division, I think they might be in first place. But, you know, that's what makes it fun. That's what makes that that division fun. That's what makes baseball fun. Love it. Love what I'm seeing out of it. Yeah, and it'll be really cool to see them uh, with the addition of Tatis later on this season uh, because they, they could, you know, easily go on a crazier run uh, than they already have uh, gone in. Uh, the last thing, too, I wanted to uh, say that there was a cool stat I saw that it was the uh, four teams with at least 25 wins in 34 games in baseball history. Uh, the old five White Sox, they won the World Series. The 2016 Cubs won the World Series. Uh, the 2018 Red Sox won the World Series. Uh, and now the 2022 Yankees have that, uh, those 25 wins in 34 games. So, that oh. you know, they, yeah, so w- watch out for that. Um, that'll be, uh, you know, something to watch, another thing to watch out for, uh, for the 2022 season. Um, all right, so that, that'll end the first part of our show. The next up will be the interview with Herb Lawrence. Uh, unfortunately, Miles can't make it to the interview. Uh, so every, everyone wave bye to Miles until uh, until next episode. I'll be yeah. back, guys. Yeah. <laughs> all right, M- Miles, anything else? Anything you want to close out for the for the week? Uh, no, you know, it's been a fun season so far. Look forward to looking forward to the next uh the next episode of our amazing podcast, something I enjoyed doing. Look forward to seeing this interview. Can't wait to see you all again. All right, Miles. Now we're going to cut over to my interview with Herb Lawrence. 
All right, I am here with Herb Lawrence. You can hear him talk White Sox baseball on the CHGO White Sox podcast on YouTube and all podcast platforms. Welcome to the show, Herb. And I also want to say uh, that you are our first ever guest on the At Bat Baseball podcast. So uh, in the words of Ken the Hawk Harrelson, this is history. I appreciate you having me on, Saul. It's pretty uh, exciting to be on. I appreciate to be the first guest on the new uh, platform. It's awesome. Thank you, sir. Oh, yeah, of course. And uh, Herb, we'll, we'll start things off with uh, just you tell, telling us a little bit about yourself and also like your how did, how did you get your love for baseball? Well, i um, born and raised out in the western suburbs, mostly Wheaton, Carroll Stream area. And my parents really didn't like sports, really like the Bulls or something like that and the Bears. But as far as baseball, they really had no rooting interest. So I grew up as a person that didn't have strong Cubs or Sox ties to myself my aunt used to take me a couple Cubs games when I was like in the 80s but in like 1990 I decided to go with the White Sox just because of the good colors they had kind of introduced the colors they were now the white and the pinstripe and the SOX uh, with the old English D or old English uh, SOX down the side and so I was like man that looks really nice and then of course everybody started gravitating to it because of the classic White Sox SOX hat. And I still see people wearing those, but I am kind of a contrarian. So I was not going to go with the more popular Cubs because they were just coming off the NL East championship of 1989. I was like, eh, I don't like that scene as a 12, 13 year old. I was like, I'm good. Let me go over to the other side, even though, you know, as a suburban kid, I never went to any games until probably 1995 was the first White Sox game I attended in the stadium so my fandom started in 1990 and i didn't attend a game till 1995 but i'm still here you know i regret it every once in a while because the white Sox drive me crazy and all white Sox fans <laughs> no i that hey just man I, I as as for me being a cubs fan or just any chicago sports fan like we just know there's times where we're just like oh man just why like why this city you know but mm-hmm. uh no, yeah, uh, I will say this too with the 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 Sox logo that you like. That's definitely the Sox logo. Like, I think is the best one. Like, I I still have like as much as uh, I think the the black Sox hat with you know um uh, with the Sox logo they have now. Like that has gotten really big, and it's I mean since like the nineties mm-hmm. been pretty big, I should say. But um, I do hope that they they do return to that other you know the the, the white and the red colors. But I don't think it will. Mm-hmm. But just because especially. I feel like the South side uh, jerseys kind of boosted the, that colorway of black and white still. So I think it, they'll stay like that for a while. But um, now just uh, to kind of get uh, your gauge on the White Sox this year, like what are your overall thoughts on them? I know, I mean, it's been, uh, to be honest, it's pretty wild uh, as we sit here on May 17th, uh, 2022. I mean, the injuries, like the offensive struggles from defensive struggles, uh, they've been through a lot and they sit still second in the AL Central uh, behind the twins, but it's, they're obviously way catchable. Like what, where do you sit at right now? Right now on the white Sox, they're one game over 500 at 18 and 17. So through 35 games, they have played poorly, very poorly, especially on offense where they're not getting on base. I think they're 28th in the league and on base percentage, at like a 283 mark. And that in turn makes you not score a lot of runs, which they're probably in the bottom half of runs, I haven't checked it as of late, but they were a couple of days ago. So it's not very advantageous. And then their winning streak, they had a couple, like the last week before the Yankees came in, it was six wins in a row where they scored no more than four runs in any of those games. So they can win games because their pitching staff is pretty solid, especially their starters. But the back of the baseball card for the hitters hasn't shown up for most of the players. Tim Anderson is doing a good job. Yoman Kata just came back. Luis Roberts having a good year. Other than that, it's really hard to find a guy on the White Sox, especially on the offensive side, that's having a year that you expect them to. Now, that's kind of a good thing because they're struggling without the guys having maximum performance. If they play to the back of the baseball cards, these guys will win games. They will score runs and a little bit more runs because they'll be a little bit more patient at the plate. We see Jose Abreu the last couple of days taking like four walks. Walks breathe life into an offense. They are just as good as a hit, as the people like to say. And so that's what the White Sox main problem is. Starting pitcher has been solid, really solid. Even without one of their top pitchers, Lance Lynn, who's been out the whole year, won't come back until June. 
and they just got um, uh, Johnny Cueto off of uh, the minor league deal that they signed, and he pitched well on Monday in Kansas City. So I'm very excited about the starting pitching going forward, and I know the hitters are going to hit. So this is a blip in the 35 games that they've played. It's been subpar, but I know also it's early and that they're not really this team. Defensively, they've been piss poor too. So all these things combined make a team that is 18 and 17, just a mediocre squad, which they should be much better than they are. No, yeah, definitely. And when everyone at, like ever asked me like, oh, like the, the, what's going on with the White Sox? Will they make the playoffs? And I'm like, yeah, dude, it's too early. I think they'll be fine. I don't, as much as like the Twins, uh, as, as much as like their pitching staff has looked all right, I don't necessarily trust their like their pitching at all in general, like for like 162 games. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and we, we don't know much. And we also don't know if Bucks and will play, hopefully he will play the whole season, right? But um or most of it at least so yeah I think they'll be fine and uh, kind of going off that too is uh what where do you stand on Tony La Russa now I saw uh, a little bit of your rant uh, following the 12 to 9 uh uh loss to Cleveland so I kind of know where you stand where with old school guys but kind of with uh, Tony La Russa I know it's I feel like with the White Sox Twitter it's always interesting to see what you guys think especially for example today I saw a little more chat around like the lineups and how it's uh I, it, uh, yeah it, it just a lot of lineup changes right so what are your thoughts on Tony La Russa well, my partner, uh, one of my partners at CHGO White Sox is Sean Anderson, and he sent out a tweet today via the CHGO White Sox Twitter that said the White Sox have played 35 games, and they've had 35 unique lineups. They'll play the second game of this doubleheader soon, and they'll have 36 unique lineups because before the game, Tim Ander- uh, Tony La Russa said that Tim Anderson is not going to play, and neither is Luis Robert in the second game, and Jose Abreu will be the DH. So what... I know of baseball players and what I've always been told is that they're creatures of habit. They want to know where they are every day. Like, okay, am I a starter? Am I a starter today? Am I sitting down? Where am I at in the lineup? So many times Tony has had different people up and down the lineup, not with any like logic. Lurie Garcia, who is a probably below average hitter all overall, he had him hitting third in lineup twice and hit him hitting second in the game right after he hit third, that should never happen. He shouldn't be hitting anywhere near the top two thirds of the lineup. He should be seven, eight or nine in every lineup that he's in with the White Sox. And then the other day he had one of their best hitters, Andrew Vaughn, young player, first year player. He had his rookie year last year, and this is his first full year. He had him hitting ninth. Everybody in White Sox Twitter went off because this guy is not a ninth hitter. He is a three, four, five hitter currently, especially in the lineup they threw out. The other day, he was hitting behind Lurie Garcia. It was a travesty. I just don't like that he, as a Hall of Fame manager, knows that he can do no wrong. He knows he's never going to get it fired because they've already fired him back in 1986. And the guy who allowed that firing, Jerry Reinsdorf, won't ha- let that happen again as he hired him back in 2020, in October of 2020, to lead them to a World Series. They're nowhere near a World Series. And the manager is a small part of that because his lineups are terrible. His pitching um, changes are kind of subpar. He's not a guy where you're winning because of, or it's just negligible because you, it doesn't matter. I'm mean, usually a manager. It don't matter that much. This guy is actively trying to ruin the White Sox or just actively trying to show people how smart he is. And everybody who's sitting at home is like, no, that's a dumb thing you're doing. It might work out, but the process of you doing it is dumb. The results don't really matter because you started off poorly. No, yeah, I mean, I think, and and yeah, as you uh, made a point with Reinsdorf thing, like what I can't imagine as a Sox fan hearing that type of news or or hearing that type of story about how like it seems that's almost like a favor that he hired mm-hmm. Tony Larissa back because especially in in this era of White Sox baseball, you you need everything to go right because of the players that that are on the field. So it, I feel like it stings to hear that. Also, I mean, with Reinsdorf, there's been history of him just like. Just saying stuff like, for example, I, uh, that there's been, uh, I think it was one of the, um, uh, uh, somebody in the front office for the Marlins said that Reinsdorf mm-hmm. uh, once said that, you know, it's better to keep, you know, the team second or like have them want, have the fans wanting more, have them like not win a World Series, um, which I'm like, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it tracks. It tracks yeah. with uh, yeah, it the really White does. Sox career. Like he, mm-hmm. they won one World Series. But mostly all through the 90s, the White Sox were the second place team behind Cleveland. 
after the strike came. And then in Minnesota in the 2000s and Detroit in the mid 2000s, like he's mostly been a mediocre team. Even the World Series championship team wasn't supposed to do what they did. They were a bunch of ragtag people put together by Kenny Williams with only three people who the White Sox drafted and cultivated themselves. So nobody expected them to win the World Series. I think most publications picked them to be third or fourth in that division themselves. So, yeah, that's his MO. And that was David Sampson, the former uh, Marlins yeah. uh, president. Mm-hmm. And he now he has a, a podcast that's kind of popular. And he said that on that. And then, yeah, I do not too, too much disagree, even though David Sampson himself is a questionable yeah. character for what they did down there in Miami. <laughs> Oh yeah, definitely. That's I know I've heard a lot of people like, oh shit, I don't know if I should believe that, but mm-hmm. if, if there's if there's one thing I'm gonna believe that comes out of David Sanson, it's probably be that. Probably be that. Um, another thing I want to talk about the White Sox too, and you kind of alluded a little bit to it, is uh, just their defense is kind of surprising. I mean, Tim Anderson, we've seen Tim Anderson have these struggles before in his career, but they've mm-hmm. somehow come back. Uh, do you do you see something with his his defense? I mean, he has nine uh, of the White Sox 26 errors and negative four defensive runs saved. So. Is there something you see in his game? Like, is it maybe a lack of confidence or is it just something that, you know, that he'll, it'll like be gone by the end of the season? It's something with concentration. I don't know what's happening off the field. That's none of my concern, but also don't let it go on to the field because a lot of lackadaisical play, a lot of lazy play. Most of these errors are because of him not setting up right and him not getting the feet right. Just, letting the arm float through the zone and throwing a terrible throw. And Jose Abreu was not the guy that was the MVP a couple of years ago where he improved his defense immensely and became a nice first baseman this year. He's kind of shaky. So he's not saving the airs that Tim would usually be throwing. So yeah, I think it's just focus. Tim needs to get in his, get out of his own mind sometimes. And like most of these airs that he's made in the nine have come in piles, like same in game. I remember one game, I think he made two errors in consecutive innings. And I was like, that's not Tim. He can make errors, but making errors like that is something else. So I was thinking that since he's made his ninth there, I think that's been like a week and a half. He's been pretty mm-hmm. solid, stellar at uh, shortstop. And that's the thing. White Sox fans don't expect an airless Tim Anderson. We know what, we com- what comes with him. We expect him to make plays that are out there for him to make plays. Like you get to a ball, you have plenty of time to make the play, throw a strong throw over there. We know you have a cannon. Stop being like a days ago. Stop being lazy and get the ball over there with a little zip like you, we know you can do. And that's what we hold Tim to that high standard because we know he can be better than he has been showing defensively this year. And the whole team, I think, feeds off what Tim and Jose Abreu do. So if he's loafing going to first, Team will feed off that. Tim's his leader. That's why he wanted to be the leadoff hitter. And so he's doing well for the team offensively. The defense is struggling. They see that and they're like, okay, if our leader's doing bad, you know, what, what does that leave us? And also the White Sox are playing first baseman in the outfield with uh, uh, Loy Jimenez being out. He's not that great in left field himself. They have to play Andrew Vaughn and Gavin Sheets and left and right field. Those guys are first baseman by trade. Not good at defense at all. Saw Gavin drop a ball right to him. Last night, we saw a ball go over the head of Andrew Vaughn, which a regular left fielder would at least made a good play at it. Andrew was lost. He made a good uh, throw back to Timmy, and then Timmy threw the ball right to Yasmani Grandal's glove. And Yasmani Grandal, like he wants to do sometimes, dropped the ball. It was an out. They could have got the guy out. It would have been a 3-1 to one game. Instead, there was 3-2. The next guy hits a single tied up the game at 3-3. Those type of lapses in judgment and those uh, execution lapses will cost the White Sox eventually if they don't nip them in the bud right now. It's been happening from time to time, but since Timmy has cleaned up, the White Sox have cleaned up their defense for the most part. Yeah, and that's that's the good thing about it. it, it is all this happening, whether whatever it is happening early in the season, because you got time to fix it. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to uh, the deadline, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, the struggles with you know Liam Hendricks and stuff like that. But what what is is the a bullpen arm? What the White Sox need, or in your eyes, what's the like one or two things that they need to get at the deadline? They need another bat desperately. Uh, bullpen, they have enough arms. They've spent a lot of money this offseason on Kendall Graveman 
and Joe Kelly, Joe Kelly who came in today's game and loaded the bases, then quickly got three straight outs without giving up a run. But they need more of a left-handed hitter that's more consistent with what Gavin Sheets is. So maybe a guy that is on a losing team that is just hitting a bunch of bombs, a guy like Daniel Vogelbach, who's out there in Pittsburgh, he's just crushing balls. I would have loved to had Kyle Schwarber as a free agent before he signed with the Phillies because he's the perfect prototype for the White Sox to put at the designated hitter spot and maybe get a couple spots out there and right. He can't be worse than what Gavin Sheets has shown out there in right field or uh, Andrew Vaughn. And if they can't do that, just get a straight DH type guy. The Boston Red Sox are right now struggling. And J.D. Martinez, I think, is on his last year of his deal. So a bat like that would recharge the White Sox big time for the stretch drive. They need more runs, more guys to get runs, generate runs, and knock in runs. So those type of players who either knock the ball at the park like Daniel Vogelbach or a more of a balanced guy like J.D. Martinez who would get the walks and also knock the ball at the park are what the White Sox need. Because right now with DH, they're doing sometimes Yasmani Grandal. They're doing sometimes Gavin Cheats. Sometimes it's Andrew Vaughn. I need more of a steady designated hitter, a person that knows his job and shows up and post every night. No, yeah, it's yeah. Th- those are yeah. I being a Cubs fan, seeing Daniel Vogelbach a lot. That that guy's <laughs> is definitely mashing right now. Uh, but yeah, and another thing too, and you did mention him earlier too, is Yohan Moncada and him coming back. Um, I feel like if he hits the as you know con- as consistently as he's doing now, um, I think he can do a lot for the uh, White Sox offense. But overall, I feel like we haven't seen the best of him since 2019. Uh, do you think he'll find that again? And do you, and how far do you think his offense can carry the, the Sox if he is his 2019 self? I think he can carry him far because he'll be at the top of the order. He's a guy that White Sox need. This is a guy that got on almost 38% of the time last year, one of the highest on base percentages, not only in the White Sox, but in the league. And he plays a pretty solid third baseman, a third base. I think he's one of the top five. Some say he's a top 10 guy. Uh, as a third baseman in the league. And if he plays the 2019, there would be no questions about that. That was the year where he got a vote for MVP and he looked the part. Everybody in 2020 was expecting the progression, the the lift up from 2019, because he's relatively young. I think he's still 27, 28 years old now, but he got COVID before the season and it pretty much wiped him out. We saw him on the bases in 2020 where he scored from th- or third or from first And he's in the dugout as a 25-year-old at the time, just exhausted. They're wiping him down. They're fanning him down. It's like, that isn't that far of a run. It is, but you've done this for years. And But COVID knocked him out. So I'll give him that year. And 2021, it was a very disappointing season offensively because we're expecting the home runs to go to the next level. But he was on base. He walked a lot. He didn't hit the home runs that White Sox fans thought he was. And he's kind of like a polarizing figure on White Sox Twitter, it kind of reminds me of Chris Bryant with the Cubs fans, where there's a faction, a loud, maybe a loud minority faction that do not like Yohan Moncada. But everybody else who has eyes and enjoys baseball enjoys what Yohan Moncada brings to the table for the White Sox, especially as a two-hitter, especially as a switch hitter. We know he's going to hit for power. He's already come back last week, and he's hit two home runs while he sat out for three of the games that the White Sox have played. He has shown a lot of pop. And the thing that was as bugaboo last year was catching up to high fastballs. He had a home run off a 98 mile per hour fastball high in the zone. So that doesn't seem to be a problem. He looks like he's in great shape, a little yoked up. And we know the defense is going to play. So I'm fine with Yoan Moncada coming back and being the guy. And then we should see him in the second game of the doubleheader and the rest of the series in Kansas city. Cause that's a, a team that he crushes too. So I'm excited for Yohan Moncada coming back, playing for the White Sox for the rest of the year and staying healthy for the most part. Yeah, that would be huge. Uh, I know I did, uh, before I let you go, I do want to ask you one general baseball question. Uh, what, like, what are your overall thoughts on, you know, the offense, the lack of offense in general? And like, do you, you actually think is like, oh, that they, they, they have messed with the baseballs? I mean, it's pretty obvious that they have, but I mean, mm-hmm. what, what are your thoughts overall on that? I think Rob Manfred's doing too much tinkering. Like he's messing up. Like you see the NFL, you see the NBA and they're like, you know, how do I get younger fans in here? Let's restrict people from touching the quarterback. Let's restrict people from touching receivers. Let's produce more offense. 
Same thing with the NBA. No more hand checks. No more stuff like this. We're opening up the offense. Everybody's going to be exciting. The action's going to be good. And Rob Manfred's like, nah, you know, kids love balls that are crushed that get caught at the warning track instead of going over the fence like they usually did. And there's been so many balls like that this year for not only the White Sox, but for all teams, MLB wide. They introduced humidors for all 30 ballparks. So it's shown the stats have shown that it's deadened the ball even more than the 10 uh, stadiums that had humidors last year. So whatever's happening with the change of the ball, which they're using two ty- different types of ball, one with the, the seams raised. So he'll catch a little bit more of the air and drag a ball down. Or if a pitcher can get a little bit more spin, if the seams are raised a little bit more. And it just doesn't make sense. If you want to make the game better, if you want to look to the youth and say, hey, why aren't you watching us? You don't introduce more defense and restrictive things on offense to bring these kids in. You introduce more offense. 2019 was a huge example. We had the most home runs in the history of the game. And we had the team that had the most home runs in a single season in the Minnesota Twins. That propelled them to an AL Central Championship. Everybody was fine with that. No one blinked an eye that the Minnesota Twins hit that many home runs. We were like, hey, man, if you can do it, you can do it. If everybody's using the same ball, everybody is playing by the same rules, we're cool with it. Now, two different balls out there, humidors in every stadium. You're you're damping down offense. And Joe Sheehan, who has his own newsletter, just put out a thing that this is the seventh worst on-base percentage of any May in the history of the game. Seventh worst in an offense. I mean, the weather in May has been pretty good. In an mm-hmm. offensive like atmosphere where players are hitting the ball harder than they've ever have, you're having the seventh worst on-base percentage in the history of Mays. That's unacceptable. And that is Rob Manfred's legacy, messing up the baseball game. I hope he resigns out of uh, because he failed. I hope he resigns out of embarrassment because he just actively messes this game up every chance he gets. And I want somebody who likes baseball, who understands they need to go out outside of the church to bring in the young f- folks instead of preaching to the choir and preaching to the people already in the congregation. I'm not going anywhere. Don't preach to me, Rob Manfred. Go outside the church. Find some people to bring in and talk to them. No, yeah, that, that, that's, I mean, that's on point. I mean, multiple times I feel like there's been opportunities for him to be like, you know what, I was wrong, I'll mm-hmm. resign. You know what I Like, I, I, I thought that and I'm like, oh, this is a good time for him to go. But uh, he just uh, hasn't. And, and unfortunately, I feel like he's going to be around for a long time. So um, hopefully I'm wrong, but we'll see. Uh, well, Herb, it was a real pleasure having you, man, talking baseball. I'm sure we'll have you on again sometime. We'd love to have you. Uh, just thanks for all your thoughts and uh, appreciate the time. Thank you for having me. And yes, next time your partner in crime, I'll be with both you guys. So hit me up. You got my uh, you got my Twitter DM. So hit me up. And I'll be ready to go. I appreciate you having me on. All right. Thanks, sir. All right. Take it easy.